What I'd like to talk about this evening is the Mithraic Mysteries. The fact is that great secrets have been kept from us. There are mysteries lying at the heart of, of our culture. The mystery that we're going to be speaking about tonight is one that has been lost for about 2,000 years. It's been that long uh, since the Mithraic Mysteries flourished in the Roman Empire. Now when I use the term uh, mystery, I don't mean uh, necessarily, although it is in fact the case, but what I'm not saying is that this is a mysterious uh, religion. That's not the reference here. It is indeed a mysterious religion. But this is a technical term used by historians of religion to refer to a particular type of cult that existed in the ancient Mediterranean world. The word itself, uh, the word mystery, comes from the Greek word for these cults. They were called mysteria in Greek. That was the name of these religions. And from the name of these religions came our English word mystery, as well as the word uh, mystical, mysticism. All of the words uh, of that family come from the name of these ancient religions, the mysteria. Uh, the word mysteria uh, originally was one particular uh, cult in uh, ancient Greece. The Eleusinian mysteries uh, were originally called uh, simply the mysteria, which meant uh, in Greek, it means the mouth-closed festival. Mysterion. Uh, the mus uh, comes from a root that means to keep the mouth closed. And mysteria uh, is a root that means uh, uh, a festival. This was the mouth-closed festival because you were not permitted to speak about what transpired during the initiatory rites at the town of Eleusis. I'll be speaking more about this tomorrow at the workshop. Um, and so the festival came to be known as the Mouth Closed Festival. It was uh, forbidden to speak about what you experienced there under penalty of death. If the, uh, the innermost uh, experiences were revealed to outsiders, you could be punished with death. That was the Eleusinian Mysteries, the Mysterion, which gave rise to the whole tradition of, of ancient mystery cults in the Mediterranean world, of which the Mithraic Mysteries that I'm going to be speaking about tonight are one of the most important examples. Uh, one of the reasons that the Mithraic Mysteries are so uh, important for us is that this particular mystery cult, the Mithraic Mysteries, arose in the Mediterranean world at exactly the same time that Christianity did. Exactly the same time and exactly the same place. And I therefore feel that uh, both the Mithraic Mysteries and Christianity represent two responses, two different responses to the same set of underlying cultural forces. And therefore, if we can learn more about what the Mithraic Mysteries were about, we can learn more about the choice that our culture made 2,000 years ago. One path was taken and another was not. Christianity became the dominant symbolic system of Western culture. But other possibilities were present at that time. And it's my own feeling, although of course there's no way to prove this, but I think that any time in life when one path is chosen and another isn't, the path not chosen remains as a potential within life. And in this case, the Mithraic Mysteries represent the, the unchosen path that has persisted as a latent potentiality within Western civilization. It represents the unconscious, or at least part of the unconscious, of our culture. But the Mithraic Mysteries, like the Eleusinian Mysteries, were a 
uh, extremely carefully kept secret. And this is true for all of the ancient mystery cults, the mysteries of Isis and Cabelli, the Orphic mysteries, Pythagorean mysteries, Mithraic and Eleusinian. Uh, all of these secrets were kept. We do not know what the, uh, the, central, uh, the central experiences were of any of these ancient mystery cults, except perhaps now for the Mithraic mysteries. Because if, my, if the argument uh, that I've made is correct, and you'll have a chance to evaluate it for yourselves tonight, uh, it would appear that I have been able to unlock the central secret of the Mithraic Mysteries. And that is what I will try to do for you to here tonight. The Mithraic Mysteries began to spread in the Roman Empire uh, in the first century AD. What you see, uh, the slide that is currently up is a map of the Mediterranean world and every place on this map where you see a name was the location of a Mithraic temple or where uh, Mithraic evidence has been discovered. Okay, yes, Ellen? Um, I think that's about the best. Perhaps if we turned off the lights people could see a bit better. Well, why was it forbidden to speak about these cults? Well, well, I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, probably because the secret was believed to be so powerful that it was best uh, best kept within a closed circle. But we're, uh, we'll, we'll discuss that a little later. Uh, here you see the boot of Italy. Here's Greece, uh, uh, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, North Africa stretching over to the other part of North Africa, Egypt, the Nile River, uh, Asia Minor, Palestine, and Syria. There are Mithraic temples found uh, all through that area, even up in, in England, in the northwest. Uh, there's a Mithraic temple in, in, uh, in the center of London, and if you're interested, uh, the, uh, the Walbrook Mithraeum. Uh, so it's a very widespread religion. And as I said, it began to spread through the Roman Empire uh, around the first century AD, or perhaps a bit earlier. Can we have the lights again, Michael? Um, I'm going to be moving back and forth between the slides and the blackboard fairly often. Now, the first, uh, the first physical evidence for the Mithraic Mysteries, as I said, is around the first century AD. Although we can trace its origins a bit earlier because the ancient historian Plutarch tells us that around 67 BC the Roman general Pompey encountered uh, a group of pirates, a large army of pirates from uh, from South Eastern Asia Minor in this area known as Cilicia, the Pirates of Cilicia. And Plutarch tells us that the pirates of this area, who at that time controlled the entire, uh, entire Mediterranean Sea, they had become so powerful. That's why Pompey was entrusted with uh, responsibility for overcoming them. Uh, Plutarch tells us that in 67 BC, Pompey discovered uh, that the pirates of Cilicia were practicing secret rites of Mithras. This is our earliest reference to the mystery religion uh, which worshipped the god Mithras. And that, indeed, is the name of the god worshipped in the Mithraic mysteries. However, most scholars, uh, certainly over the past few centuries, since the 1700s, most scholars have assumed that the Mithraic mysteries, as they are found in the Roman Empire, were actually a development from an earlier uh, Persian religion. We find in ancient Iran or Persia the cult of a god named Mithra. 
It's the same name. The S is, is added in Greek or Latin to the Persian Mithra. Mithra was worshipped in ancient Iran as early as uh, 2000 BC and probably even earlier. In fact, Mithra is an Indo-European god worshipped uh, in India, among the Hittites as well, going back very far into Indo-European history. And so most scholars, because the name of the god of the Roman cult is the same as the name of the god of the Persian cult, most scholars have assumed that the Roman Mithraic mysteries were derived from the ancient Iranian cult of Mithra. However, there are some very serious problems uh, with that theory. The theory was propounded in its modern form by a great scholar whom some of you may have heard of named Franz Cumont, who at the turn of the century in 1899 published a massive two-volume work in which he gathered together for the first time all of the primary evidence uh, relating to the Mithraic mysteries and that constituted one volume of his work. Volume two then consisted of his interpretation of the evidence which he had so painstakingly gathered in volume one. And because his interpretation was presented as an accompaniment to his, uh, his presentation of the primary sources, uh, it came to be seen as authoritative. And Cumal's theories were unchallenged for most of the 20th century. And Cumal based his explanation on the, uh, the assumption, the hypothesis, that the Roman cult was derived from the worship of the ancient Iranian god Mithra. However, as I said, there are some very serious, in fact, I think, uh, uh, fatal problems with that hypothesis. Because the Roman cult of Mithras possesses as uh, its inherent characteristics uh, properties which are completely absent from the Persian worship of Mithra. First of all, there is no evidence in ancient Iran of any, uh, of any element of, of uh, esoteric secrecy connected with the worship of Mithra. The Roman cult was a secret initiatory mystery cult. Nothing like that is found in ancient Iran connected with Mithra. Secondly, uh, the Roman cult is characterized by uh, a particular form of temple. And now I'll take you inside a Mithraic temple. Maybe we should turn off the lights in order to enter the, the inner sanctum here. These temples are found all over the Mediterranean world. We have hundreds and hundreds that have been excavated. This one is in Capua, Italy. Uh, and the Mithraic temples uh, are distinguished by the fact that they are almost always underground. They are uh, um, subterranean and they're made to look as if they are caves. They're cave-like and they're called caves. And here we see a typical example. Uh, this is underground and here uh, down the middle is an aisle and on either side of the aisle are benches where the cult's uh, devotees would sit during their, their meetings. And in the most important part of every Mithraic temple, here you see it against the back wall, was found a particular icon. And this icon depicted the god Mithras in the act of killing a bull with a dagger. You can't see it well here. We'll see many more examples in a moment. But here's the god Mithras. Here's the, a large white bull. And Mithras is uh, in the act of, of, uh, of driving a dagger into the bull's neck. Also in the picture uh, are always found a dog, a snake, and a scorpion. You can't see the scorpion very well. We'll see it in a moment. And a raven. A dog, a snake, a scorpion, a raven, and a bull are always found in this scene. Uh, the so-called bull slaying scene or uh, toroctony, which just means bull slaying. 
Where did you say this temple is located? This is in Capua, in Italy. This is one in Rome, uh, beneath the church of San Clemente. Quite a number of Mithraic temples are located under churches. Uh, the, uh, the early Christians, in order to, uh, to indicate their conquest of uh, their rivals, built their churches uh, sometimes on top of pagan, uh, non-Christian temples. And this, um, this Mithraic temple can be found beneath the church of San Clemente, a beautiful church in Rome, and there's a little hole in the floor with, uh, with uh, stairs that go down to, to, uh, to deeper levels. And there beneath uh, the early Christian church is found a deeper level where we have the underground sanctuary of Mithras. Are any catacombs actually temples? I'm sorry? Any of the catacombs are actually Mithras temples? Not that I know of, no. Uh, here again, you have the aisle in the center, the two benches on either side, and here in the middle is another representation of the bull slaying scene. Mithras uh, killing the bull with his dagger, the dog, the snake, the scorpion, and the raven are there. Uh, notice, I think you can see here an, an interesting detail that we'll talk about later. Mithras always turns his head away from the bull as he kills it, which is a very awkward uh, and unusual uh, posture. It's very uh, hard to kill an animal while you're looking away from it, and we need to find some explanation for why Mithras might be doing that. Here's a much clearer example, and as I said, we have hundreds and hundreds of these icons left from antiquity. Uh, this is a very beautiful bull slaying scene. Here you see the god Mithras turning his head away from the bull as he always does. Here's the dog, the snake, the scorpion. Uh, the scorpion is attached to the bull's testicles. This is the, uh, uh, the normal location of the scorpion. Up here is the raven. And notice the hat that Mithras is wearing. He always is shown wearing this uh, conical-shaped soft cap that curls over at the top. That's his trademark. It's called a, uh, a Phrygian cap. And we'll talk about that a bit later as well. Notice here uh, on either side of the bull are two figures carrying torches. One carrying a torch pointed up, the other on the other side carrying a torch pointed down. These uh, so-called torch bearers are almost always found in the bull slaying scene. Okay, can we have the lights again, Michael, for a moment? Maybe that hat makes him invisible. Um, what would make him invisible? Well, then he wouldn't be detected. The, the cap? That's a very interesting point. Um, why would you say that? Well, I know that's what uh, Mercury used in uh, Greek, uh, Greek mythology. That's right, yes. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. That's very interesting. Where is this particular one? This, um, this is from Rome. I don't recall offhand. I think it's, it, it's to be found in, in, in the Vatican Museum, but I don't know what temple it came from originally. I'd have to check into that. Now, as I was saying, uh, the ancient Iranian cult of Mithra was not uh, an initiatory mystery, nor are there any underground temples um, associated with the Iranian god Mithra, nor is there any iconography of any sort like that which we find in the Roman Empire associated with the Iranian cult of Mithra. The three most distinguishing characteristics of the Roman cult are completely absent in ancient Iran. That didn't stop Franz Cumont, however. He uh, continued always to assume that because the names of the gods were the same, that there must be some connection. And so he tried to find Persian myths about bulls and dogs and snakes and so on, all of which, unfortunately, were unconnected with the god Mithra. Uh, and he put them all together and came up with a composite picture uh, drawn out of bits and pieces of ancient Persian mythology, which he said 
uh, was the explanation or interpretation of this bull slaying scene. The fact is, the unfortunate fact for Franz Cumont and his followers is that there, in, in no known uh, Iranian myth does the god Mithra have anything to do with killing a bull. There is no known Iranian myth in which Mithra kills a bull, or indeed has anything to do with a bull. So Cumont assumed uh, that it must have been derived from some other Iranian myth. He found a Persian myth in which a bull is indeed killed. Uh, but in the myth that he chose, the bull is killed not by Mithra, but rather by, uh, by Ahriman, the force of cosmic evil in ancient Persian mythology. And Cumont argued that this myth in which Ahriman, the force of cosmic evil, kills a bull uh, must have been transformed at some point uh, into a myth in which Mithra replaced Ahriman. There's no evidence for such a transformation whatsoever, uh, but that was the basis of Cumont's interpretation. And uh, so powerful was Cumont's authority as a scholar, and he was a uh, uh, unsurpassed classicist and scholar of ancient religions. My own work uh, in my book is, is deeply dependent on that of Franz Cumont. Nevertheless, in this case, I think he was completely misguided. Uh, in fact, at one point, after Cumont presents his reconstruction of the meaning of the bull slaying scene based on taking bits and pieces of ancient Persian mythology, he says to his readers the following, we who have never experienced the Mithraic spirit of grace are apt to be disconcerted by the incoherence and absurdity of this body of doctrine, such as it has been shown forth in my reconstruction. In other words, he was admitting that his reconstruction appeared to be incoherent and absurd. <laughs> but he never, he never uh, seems to have questioned whether that was the... Um, because the, the ancient, uh, the ancient uh, Mithraists themselves were incoherent and absurd, or whether perhaps it was his own reconstruction that was incoherent and absurd. In any event, these problems uh, remained uh, apparently unimportant for most of the 20th century, from 1899 when Cumont published his book until the early 1970s. Cumont's interpretation was unchallenged. And even today, if you look in any uh, encyclopedia or textbook of ancient religions, and you go to find out what Mithraism was, what you will find there is what Franz Cumont said in 1899. But in 1971, uh, an international congress of Mithraic studies was held in Manchester, England. Uh, the first such uh, gathering of uh, Mithraic specialists. And at that meeting in 1971, uh, two very important scholars, uh, uh, backed up by uh, some other people as well, presented for the first time devastating critiques of Cumont's Iranian hypothesis. They pointed out the, fa that the fact that uh, in actuality, the only reason to connect Roman Mithraism, the Roman cult of Mithras, with the ancient cult uh, in Persia of Mithra, the only reason is that the names of the gods are the same. Everything else is different. And these uh, two, uh, two, um, two scholars suggested that it was possible that the Roman cult of Mithra, of Mithras, was in fact a new religion that had been created somewhere in the Greco-Roman world which had merely adopted the name of an ancient Persian god in order to give itself an aura of oriental um, exoticness, in order to give it um, a flavor of antiquity and mystery but that the religion was actually newly created and had nothing whatsoever to do with ancient Persia. This was revolutionary within the study of the Mithraic mysteries. For the first time in the 20th century, Franz Cumont had been challenged, and from that point on, it could no longer be assumed that 
the Roman cult of Mithras was derived from the ancient Persian religion of Mithra. More importantly, it could no longer be assumed that this picture that you see in front of you was a representation of ancient Persian mythology. In fact, from 1971 on, nobody knew what this picture represented. It had suddenly become completely enigmatic. That was uh, the way things were when I was in graduate school and I was in a, uh, a course on Greco-Roman religions. Um, at the time I didn't know anything about Mithraism or about Franz Cumal. Um, and my professor, uh, John Gager at Princeton, was moving toward uh, a lecture on, on uh, the Mithraic mysteries. And he decided to play a little trick on us. He knew, whereas we didn't, he knew that Franz Cumal, uh, that Franz Cumal's interpretation was no longer uh, unchallenged. And he knew that this picture was actually uh, uh, no longer understood. And so he decided to show us an example of the bull slaying scene in class and ask us if we knew what the picture represented. He just asked us to brainstorm a bit and try to, to figure out what was going on in this icon. And I sat there, uh, looked at the picture, and I immediately recognized what the picture represents. I didn't say anything in class. I just sat there looking. I, I assumed that what I saw had been seen long ago and dismissed by scholars far more learned than myself. But uh, nevertheless, I thought I saw something. And indeed, what I recognized at that moment was that the Mithraic bull slaying icon has absolutely nothing to do with ancient Persian mythology. But the icon is actually a star map. The Mithraic bull slaying scene is a map of the heavens. Every element, every figure in the bull slaying scene has a parallel among the constellations. Beginning, of course, with the bull, which represents obviously Taurus the bull, which is a zodiacal constellation, one of the twelve constellations that lie in one circle out of the whole, uh, the whole, um, the whole, um, sphere of the fixed stars. There's one circle through which the sun and the planets appear to move during uh, the course of time. Uh, the bull is one of those twelve constellations. We also have the scorpion, which is another zodiacal, uh, 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 zodiacal constellation. But we have um, extra zodiacal constellations pictured here as well. Constellations that lie outside the zodiac. We have Canis Minor, the dog, Hydra, the snake, and Corvus, the raven. Uh, in fact, in, in some areas of the Roman Empire, two more figures are added to the bull slaying scene. Here in this example, we see Mithras, as usual, with the dog, the snake, the scorpion, the raven. Uh, here are the two torch bearers, again, one with the torch up, one with the torch down. And here I'd like you to notice that the torch bearers have their legs crossed. Uh, they almost always have their legs crossed. This is a very interesting iconographical detail that we'll return to. And here as well, there have been added two additional figures, a lion and a cup, also constellations. Leo the lion and Crater the cup. Again, there is no figure in the Mithraic bull slaying scene, no, no animal figure, uh, which does not have a parallel among the constellations. Could that be coincidence? Well, I didn't think so, although as I said, I didn't say anything in, in class that day. Instead, I went home and got out my star maps. And I, I say that because I happen to be an amateur astronomer at the time, which is why I was able to, to see uh, what, what was going on in this, uh, in this image. I got out my star maps and began investigating these particular constellations. 
One could say, yes, it's just coincidence. You have some animals here, you have some animals in the sky, that's not so unusual. Uh, and so I, know, I, I knew that I needed, uh, in order to make the case convincing, I had to discover what these particular constellations had in common, if anything. If I could find something that all these constellations had in common, then I would be able to make the claim that this is not coincidence, that in fact these are constellations and they have been chosen for a particular purpose. And that is what I knew I need, uh, needed to do. Uh, but at the same time that I was looking at star maps, I also was uh, going to the library and coming back home about every 10 minutes with a huge pile of books doing research on Mithraism. And one of the first things that I discovered was that astronomical imagery, uh, explicit astronomical imagery, is found throughout Mithraic iconography. For example, here above the head of Mithras you see an arch. Can anybody tell me, can anybody see what is portrayed in that, in that archway? Zodiac. The, that, those are the 12 signs of the zodiac, beginning with Aries, here, Taurus, Gemini, and so on, through to Pisces. The 12 signs of the zodiac um, frame this particular bull slaying scene. Excuse me. Yes. Isn't it so, uh, through my knowledge, the strong astrological signs of the zodiac were originally developed in Iran? In Iran? In Iran. No. No, they're originally uh, Mesopotamian, uh, but how Babylonian. But kept in Iran for thousands and thousands of years as part of their iconography, a very yes, of course, and important part. That's right. So this does definitely tend to look back into uh, the Persian. Well, it does and it doesn't. Uh, the the twelve signs of the zodiac uh, are a Babylonian creation, and which spread throughout the ancient world, to Egypt, to Iran, to Greece, and so on. Uh, they're not particularly Iranian. They're found everywhere. So it's not clear that we should look to Iran necessarily because the same constellations were uh, extremely well known in, in uh, the ancient Mediterranean, which is where the Mithraic mysteries uh, were located. Uh, we don't find Mithraic temples in ancient Iran. We don't find this iconography in ancient Iran. We find it in uh, the Greco-Roman world where the zodiac was exceptionally well known. So, 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 so it's there that we should look first, I would, say, I would argue. The zodiac is on some of the uh, uh, both um, icons? Yes, only on some, not all. Any particular uh, part of the world where those are, those are found? Uh, they're found mostly in Italy and Western Europe, but also uh, in Germany, into Hungary, into Eastern Europe, and I'll show you an example from, uh, from uh, ancient Syria in a moment, far to the east. This is German, actually. Uh, this is from, from uh, Hedernheim in Germany. So you're saying that the presence of the zodiac in these friezes was not a cultural artifact of Rome, but it was all over the place where these Mithraic uh, friezes were found? Yes, yes. Uh, it, it would have been uh, well known to anyone who, who saw the icon that that, that, that was the zodiac. Uh, another example. Here's a bull slaying scene from Rome. The usual items, the dog, the snake, the scorpion, the raven is up here. The two torchbearers, uh, this torchbearer is incorrect. He is, he is a, a, um, a modern uh, restoration and he should be holding his torch up. One of them always holds the torch up, the other holds his torch down. But here you can see this, this break here is where part of, of the, the icon was lost. And here you see stars around the head of Mithras again indicating some kind of astronomical significance. And in the upper part of the bull slaying scene, you see on the left uh, the sun god with the, the rays coming out of his crown, and on the right the moon god with, uh, with the crescent moon. They are found uh, in almost all bull slaying scenes, the sun and the moon. 
Oh, I'm sorry, it's uh, the, the lunar goddess and the sun god. Do the Kabatri, are those altars and the trees? Yes. There are, in this particular example, six altars and six trees. Often there are seven altars, and it's been argued that the seven altars represent the seven planets. Uh, probably the seven stars around the head of Mithras are the, are the uh, the ancient, uh, the ancient seven planets, uh, the ones that are, are can be seen with the naked eye. Excuse me, I find it almost incredible that for 80 years that no one noticed this. Are yes. You saying that no one noticed this for 80 years? Uh, or it's for hundreds of years, or thousands of years. Well, uh, there's more to it than that. It, it had been noticed in the middle of the 19th century by. Uh, a scholar named uh, Stark who had published an article suggesting that this was an astronomical icon, but Cumont had rejected Stark's theory. Um, and Cumont's rejection was authoritative, not only because he was seen as the preeminent expert on the Mithraic mysteries, but Franz Cumont also happens to have been uh, the greatest scholar of his generation of ancient as astrology. That was his other specialty. Remarkable. Uh, he is equally well known for his, perhaps even more well known for his work on ancient astrology than he is for his work on the Mithraic Mysteries. And um, there seems to have been some kind of strange uh, schizophrenia going on here. He could not recognize what, uh, what he of all people should have seen there are reasons for that. I could go into them, but uh, we don't have that much time. Uh, here along the bottom, we have seven altars. And those seven probably represent the seven planets, although the fact that there are only six altars at the top may, makes it a little problematic. Why six rather than seven? Do they really represent the planets? Well, we just don't know. The best ones would be behind the uh, It's not, because we have other examples where we have altars with trees uh, in the same fashion where there are uh, obviously only six altars. So although it's not clear that the planets are represented here, it is clear that they are represented in this bull slaying scene because here in an arch above the head of Mithras we have not the zodiac but busts of the seven planetary gods. Uh, those uh, are the gods representing the seven planets. Does 13 have any significance? The number 13? In these, because you, on the top you have seven trees and six altars. Yes. Uh, I've never, I have never even thought about that. Uh, I, yeah. It's something to think about. Here you see again the torchbearers with their legs crossed. That's their normal attitude. Another example, this one is remarkable. Here we see the bull slaying scene taking place in the center of a circle of figures, which is the zodiac. Um, I hope I'm not blocking everyone's view. Here is Aries the ram, Taurus the bull, Gemini the twins, Cancer the crab, Leo the lion, Virgo Libra. And notice that when we get to the constellation Scorpio in the zodiac, that scorpion is in its normal place within the bull slaying scene, attached to the bull's testicles. This proves beyond any possible doubt that the scorpion, at least, in the bull slaying scene is, me is meant to represent the constellation Scorpio. There can be no doubt of that which certainly suggests that the rest of the icon as well uh, is astronomical in significance. Here is the famous Mithraic lion-headed god about which much could be said, um, standing on a globe, which uh, I will suggest to you later represents the cosmic sphere, uh, entwined with a serpent holding he was originally holding a rod in his hand. And here on his body 
are some of the signs of the zodiac. He is a zodiacal, a cosmic uh, divinity of some sort. Uh, the image of the lion-headed god is often found in Mithraic temples. And as a last example, this is uh, the roof of a Mithraic temple which has been decorated with stars, as you can see. And so what I discovered uh, in my uh, research very early on was that astronomical imagery is uh, uh, pervasive in Mithraic iconography. And this provided rather strong support for my hypothesis that the bull slaying scene itself was an astronomical image that had an astronomical significance. But I needed to find out why those constellations, why those particular constellations, what is going on here? The image is, is a star map, but what could that possibly mean? What could be its significance? But before, well, uh, I'll show you one more example. This is a star map showing a small portion of the sky uh, outside of the zodiac. And here you will see um, grouped together in a small part of the sky a dog, a snake, a cup, and a raven. Canis Minor the dog, Hydra the snake, Crater the cup, and Corvus the raven. They are all clustered together in the same part of the sky. Clearly we are not dealing here with randomly scattered constellations. If the constellations uh, pictured in the bull slaying scene were randomly scattered, then one could argue that, it, that it's just coincidence that we find figures in the bull slaying scene that happen to be paralleled by constellations. But they are not randomly scattered. They are grouped together in the sky in some kind of order. I needed to find out what, uh, what that order was and what its significance might be. But before I did that, I asked myself another question, which many of you have probably already asked yourselves. And that is, if the if the bull slaying scene, if all the figures in the bull slaying scene represent constellations, what about Mithras himself? Shouldn't he also be a constellation? Now, if I were to ask you where in the sky you would look if you wanted to answer the question, what constellation does Mithras represent? Where would you begin? Just, just based on the organization of the picture. If, if you had a star map in front of you, where would you look? Um, why? That's where we live. Well, but just, if you didn't know anything about the stars at all, but just had this picture and, and wanted to, to uh, determine what constellation Mithras represents, what particular constellation? The sun, Aries, Orion. Where is Orion in the sky? Orion is below and to the right of the bull. Where is Mithras? above the bull, directly above the bull. And so it seemed as though the most obvious thing to do would be to get out a star map, find the constellation Taurus, and see what was right above Taurus. Maybe there's something there, maybe there isn't. And so that's what I did. After class that day I went home, I got out my star map, and I looked right above Taurus. And there could have been anything there. Uh, there could have been an eagle, or a swan, or a bear, or a triangle, or a ship. There are a lot of different constellations in the sky, and I didn't know offhand what I would find. And so when I looked at the star map, I simply could not believe my eyes, because there directly above the constellation of Taurus is not an eagle, or a swan, or a bear, but there is the figure of a young Greek hero carrying a dagger and wearing a Phrygian cap, just like Mithras. And that is the constellation which, since antiquity, has been known as Perseus, the Greek hero Perseus, directly above Taurus the bull. Uh, this is an 18th century star map, but 
here's Perseus on uh, an ancient Greek vase wearing the Phrygian cap, here covered with stars because he was known in antiquity as a constellation as well as a hero. Well, I didn't think that this could be coincidence. Uh, and I, 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 I was stunned, simply astonished. All of the figures now in the bull slaying scene could be connected with constellations. The next thing that I discovered, very interesting, I won't have time to go into this aspect of uh, the story very far, but I discovered very quickly that Perseus was famous in antiquity uh, as being, he, he was believed to have been the founder of Persia because his name is so, uh, so, so resembles the name of Persia. There are ancient myths going back as far as uh, the 5th century and 6th century BC connecting Perseus with Persia. So here I began to sense where the Persian link could have come in. I didn't understand it completely, but I saw the beginnings of, of a hypothesis here. The other thing that I discovered was that Cilicia, remember the, uh, the pirates of Cilicia, who are the earliest known practitioners of the Mithraic mysteries. Well, it happens that in Cilicia, before the origins of the, of the Mithraic mysteries, there was an earlier Greco-Roman cult. In fact, one of the most important cults practiced in, uh, in Cilicia, before the origins of the Mithraic mysteries, was a cult that worshipped, can anybody guess? I'm sorry? Perseus. Perseus. There was a deeply rooted Perseus cult in just that region of the world which Plutarch tells us was the, was the, the birthplace of the Mithraic mysteries. Well, now the pieces were falling together quickly. Uh, I had established that the bull slaying scene was an astronomical icon depicting certain constellations. I had found a plausible geographical uh, location in which a link between Mithras and Perseus, the constellation that he seems to represent, could have uh, come into being. But I still had not answered the central question. The central question is, what is it all about? What does it mean? Why would anybody take a certain group of constellations, put them together in an icon in such a way as to form uh, the, the core image of a powerful religious movement that at its height challenged Christianity for supremacy in the Greco-Roman world? What could be the connecting link uh, that would provide the explanation for the, the placement of these constellations together. I knew that, that was the question that I needed to answer. Now I think we need a little more light because I'm going to draw some diagrams. What I discovered uh, was that all of these constellations do indeed have something in common. And what they have in common is that all of them lie on a particular circle in the sky, not the zodiac. The zodiac is one circle out of the whole, uh, the, whole, um, the whole sphere of the stars. But there was another famous circle in antiquity traced among the constellations. And that is a circle known as the celestial equator not very well known today, but well known in antiquity. The celestial equator consists of the Earth's equator. Imagine this is the Earth with its equator and the polar axis. The celestial equator is the Earth's equator projected out onto the celestial sphere to form a great circle in the sky. Imagine this is the zodiac, the circle of the zodiac. The celestial equator is another circle in the sky. And the celestial equator and the zodiac 
intersect at two points. And the two points where they intersect are the equinoxes. The spring equinox and the autumn equinox. And that is why the celestial equator was so famous in antiquity, because the equinoxes were of crucial importance for the daily life of people because of their role in the agricultural cycle. The spring equinox marked the time when crops should be sown. The autumn equinox marked the time when crops should be harvested. The celestial equator was very well known in antiquity. In fact, uh, um, Plato, in one of his dialogues, the Timaeus, <coughs> describes the creation of the universe uh, by a, uh, the divine being that he calls the Demiurge, or craftsman. And Plato says that the, the Demiurge, the craftsman, when he first formed the cosmos, formed it in the shape of a cross. And Plato makes it clear that this cross shape was meant to represent the intersection of the two circles of the celestial equator and the zodiac. And the zodiac. Here, for example, is uh, a 16th century representation of the cosmic sphere, the cosmic structure. This circle, the tilted circle, divided into 12 parts, is the zodiac. And this circle in the middle is the celestial equator. They intersect at two points, one here and one in the back. And those are the equinoxes. And here you can see why Plato described those two circles as forming a cross. This cross shape formed by the celestial equator and the zodiac was very famous in antiquity. And one of the earliest representations of it is found on a Mithraic monument, a statue of the lion-headed god standing on a sphere on which we find the cross described by Plato. The cross formed by the meeting uh, of the zodiac and the celestial equator. On the previous slide, wasn't that incorrect? Because they don't have them crossing at the equinoxes. Uh, let's see. We've got... Well, yeah, it is, it is uh, incorrect. The, Painting was probably not done by an astronomer, but I mean, did, or an astrologer. This this image was extremely common in the 16th and 17th centuries. It was often represented. Uh, this is this this is called an 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 armillary sphere uh, with these with these uh, with these uh, cosmic circles indicated on it, and it was often represented just to indicate. Uh, um, astronomy in some general uh, iconographical sense. So there's the lion-headed god on the globe with the crossed circles. Now what I discovered was the following. Yes, sir? That's the, that's the tail of a snake. The serpent winds around his body, its tail is down here, and the head of the snake, you can't really see it here, but the head of the snake is coming over the head of the lion-headed figure. In one, let me wait till I get the microphone back. It's going to sound terrible on your tape. Uh, in one hand, he's carrying obviously a rod, which I would argue uh, represents the great cosmic axis that runs through the universe, the projection of the Earth's pole was understood as the great cosmic axis around which the entire universe rotates. Because in antiquity, and this is an important point to keep in mind. In antiquity, it was believed that the Earth was fixed and immovable in the center of the universe, and everything went around it. 
So what we know today to be the Earth's rotation on its axis once a day was imagined instead as the entire cosmic sphere rotating around the Earth once a day. And it rotated around an axis with two poles, the great cosmic axis. That's what I think he's holding in his left hand. In his right hand, he's holding a key. The lion-headed god almost always is depicted holding a key. What that key is, we can come to later. Okay, I think we have time to get everything in. Now, what I discovered was that all of the constellations pictured in the bull slaying scene have one thing in common. Namely, they all lie along the celestial equator. That is what they have in common. But what could be the significance of that? Again, we're left with the question, why? Well, the fact is that they lie along the celestial equator with one crucial qualification, and that is the celestial equator does not remain fixed, but, the, but rather moves slowly over the course of millennia. The celestial equator possesses a very slow movement known as the precession of the equinoxes. Now, today we know that the precession of the equinoxes uh, is caused by a, uh, a wobble in the Earth's rotation on its axis. The Earth is like a gyroscope. And if you've ever played with a gyroscope, you know that if you take a gyroscope and place it down on a table perfectly vertically, uh, the wheel in the middle will spin very fast, while the gyroscope as a whole will just stay still. Have you all seen that? I'm sure you have. But if you take the gyroscope and tilt it, say at 23 degrees, the way the Earth is tilted with respect to the plane of the solar system, if you take a gyroscope and place it down on a table tilted, the wheel in the middle will spin very fast, and the gyroscope as a whole will begin to move very slowly. Have you all seen that? That's called precession. Gyroscopes do that, and the Earth does that. The Earth's axis precesses very slowly, making a circle in the sky. Precession. The Earth's axis moves over the course of thousands of years, shifting, and it makes a circle in the sky. So today, the, the North Pole, the polar axis, uh, points toward the star Polaris. But in a few thousand years, it will point to a different star. And a few thousand years ago, it was pointing to a different star. So the pole, the North Pole gradually shifts, and it makes a circle in the sky after 25,000 years. It goes around once. That's the precession of the equinoxes. Now, if the Earth's pole is moving, very slowly with respect to the rest of the universe, then so is the Earth's equator changing its position gradually. Because the Earth's equator, of course, is defined as a circle on the surface of the Earth 180 degrees from the pole in any direction. So if the pole is changing its location, then so is the Earth's equator. And if the Earth's equator is changing its location because of the precession, then so is the celestial equator, which is defined as a projection of the Earth's equator onto the celestial sphere. So it looks like this. The Earth's axis shifts. The Earth's equator changes its position gradually. And so the celestial equator, over the course of thousands of years, gradually changes its location, moving backwards through the zodiac. So today, the spring equinox is in Pisces. Okay. In actual, actual, 
actually in the sky. Actually in the sky. In the sidereal, in the sidereal zodiac. The spring equinox, the place in the sky where the sun appears on the first day of spring. If you went outside on the first day of spring, looked up at the sun and blocked out the sun's light so that you could see the stars, the stars around where the sun is would be the stars of the constellation Pisces. That's what it means to say the sun is in such and such a constellation. It means if you blocked out the sun's light, those are the stars that you would see. The stars, are, of course, are always up there. So, to backtrack, today, uh, on the first day of spring, the sun is in the constellation Pisces, but in a few hundred years, it will be moving into another constellation. And again, does anybody know now what that is? Aquarius. This is the dawning... What? I'm sorry? It's not yet. No, there are varying estimates of when that will happen, depending on how you define the limits of the different constellations. It's an astronomical fact that in a few hundred years, certainly, the spring equinox will be well within the constellation of Aquarius. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. That's what it means. It's, yeah. Let's put uh, Aquarius over here. So in a few hundred years, the spring equinox will be in Aquarius. What I discovered was the following. The constellations pictured in the Mithraic bull slaying scene lie along the celestial equator, but they do not lie along the celestial equator as it is now when the spring equinox is in Pisces, nor do they lie along the celestial equator as it was 2,000 years ago in Greco-Roman times when the cult actually existed. Then the spring equinox was in Aries, the autumn equinox was in Libra. The constellations pictured in the bull slaying scene do not lie along the celestial equator as it was back then. Rather, the constellations pictured in the bull slaying scene have one thing in common. They lie along the celestial equator as it was 2,000 years before Greco-Roman times. In ancient Mesopotamian times, when the spring equinox was in Taurus the bull, the autumn equinox was in Scorpio the Scorpion, and all of the other constellations pictured in the bull slaying scene lie along the celestial equator as it was at that time in history. That is what they have in common. Now, my first thought was upon, uh, upon realizing that, uh, my first thought was that knowledge of this ancient position of the celestial equator must have been preserved from ancient Mesopotamian times and because of its great antiquity uh, would have come to form the core of a, uh, a mysterious body of knowledge. That was my first hypothesis and you can see why uh, I was drawn to that. But I very quickly discovered that the historians of science would not let me argue that. The reason being that the ancient Mesopotamians did not have a concept of the celestial equator. And so they would not have known what constellations lay along the celestial equator, and so there wasn't any ancient knowledge to be preserved. And at that point, I was stymied, and I was stymied for several years until I realized that the problem presented to me by this fact that, that in this problem actually lay the seed of the solution. Because the historians of science were equally well aware that the phenomenon of the precession of the equinoxes was unknown throughout antiquity until it was discovered by the Greek astronomer Hipparchus. Around 128 BC, through very careful measurements, Hipparchus discovered that the celestial equator, the cosmic sphere, uh, was moving in the way I've described to you. It was unknown before that because the movement is so slow that it's very difficult to detect. Even in, in, in a person's lifetime, it only moves a tiny bit. And so uh, ancient astronomy had to reach a certain level of, of, um, of sophistication before such a discovery could be made. And it was indeed made by Hipparchus 
around 128 BC. And here lay the solution to the mystery. Because what was it that Hipparchus discovered? Today we know that the precession of the equinoxes is a slight wobble in the Earth's rotation on its axis. But from the ancient geocentric perspective, what would the precession have looked like? If we know it to be a movement of the Earth, but they held the Earth immovable and fixed, what must the precession have looked like mathematically? The sky was moving. In fact, the precession of the equinoxes could only be understood as a movement of the entire universe. Hipparchus discovered that the entire cosmos was moving in a way that nobody had ever known before. Now, this discovery of Hipparchus's was made at a time when astrology, the astrological worldview, was absolutely uh, pervasive throughout Mediterranean culture. Uh, intellectuals and common people alike believed uh, throughout the Hellenistic and Roman periods that it was the stars that controlled human destiny. Um, everything on earth was determined by the movements of the heavenly bodies. In addition, it was believed at that time that what happens to the human soul after death is that it rises up through the planetary spheres to the realm of the fixed stars. And it had come to be believed around the time of Hipparchus that this journey of the soul after death up into the heavens was a dangerous and difficult journey. Uh, that there were obstacles to be conquered, passwords needed to be known at each stage. And we even have texts that describe uh, the fact that the different levels are locked and we need to have the keys to open those locks. It appears that the lion-headed god with the zodiac on his body standing on the cosmic sphere holding the key represents that being who holds the keys to unlock the heavenly gates through which the soul must ascend after death. Clearly a god capable of moving the entire universe would be a god eminently worthy of worship. And I believe that that is what happened. Hipparchus's discovery became known by a group of intellectuals, and I've been able to trace uh, uh, exactly who those people were and where they were active. Uh, all of that's in my book if you're interested. I don't have time to go into it tonight. Um, Hipparchus's discovery became known among a group of intellectuals who were interested in astrology and astral religion. And there it became hypothesized that this newly discovered movement of the entire cosmic sphere must be caused by some new god. A god so powerful that he was capable of moving the entire universe. And if he was capable of moving the entire universe, he was clearly a god who was able to provide or grant salvation to those who knew of his existence. He was a god who could control the stars, and since the stars in turn controlled life on Earth, uh, one who had a special connection to that god would have a special connection to the, the ultimate force of fate and destiny. In addition, a connection to a god uh, who is in control of the stars would clearly give to, uh, to his followers um, a guarantee of a safe passage through the planetary spheres after death. That, I believe, is the origin of the god Mithras. He is the god capable of shifting the cosmic spheres. And his killing of the bull represents the power that he possessed to move the entire universe in such a way that the spring equinox left the constellation of Taurus and moved into the next age. And all of the other figures in the bull slaying scene are those companions of the bull who had privileged places in the sky during the age of Taurus, which they lost as a result of the activity of the great cosmic god Mithras. Now, 
take this one step further by asking another interesting question. Let's see what the next slide is. Yes. Uh, this is just proof of the pudding in case anyone still doubts. Uh, this is an icon. I'm sorry about this. This is an icon depicting Mithras holding in one hand the cosmic sphere while with his other hand he is rotating the zodiac. <laughs> Remarkable image. Now, we have a couple questions left and then I want to uh, pose one more for you. Um, remember the two torchbearers. Who are the two torchbearers? I, fir I, I first thought they were Gemini as well, but uh, there's another explanation that makes more sense. Uh, the beginning and, and the end of a different age? The beginning and the end, not of a different age. They are the equinoxes? Yes, they are the equinoxes. Why? One's the, one's the beginning of a new season and the other is the... Okay, one is holding a torch up, indicating uh, the birth of something, the birth of life, the, the, the sun rising above the equator, the other holding the torch down, indicating death, uh, the time when agriculture uh, begins to die, the autumn. But what other detail suggests the crossed legs? Remember their crossed legs. What is that? That's that great cross described by Plato the intersection point of which is the equinox. The two torchbearers represent the two equinoxes. And proof of this is provided by monuments like this, where we see the two torchbearers with their legs crossed. The torchbearer on the left is carrying something in his, in his arm. Can you see what it is? It's not very clear. It's the head of a bull. The torchbearer on the right is carrying a scorpion. Taurus the bull, Scorpio the scorpion. The two equinoxes of the time indicated by the astronomical symbolism of the bull slaying scene. Even further, in this uh, bull slaying scene, we see uh, on this side a torch pointed down with a scorpion next to a tree with fruit on it, a tree in fruit, which represents autumn. From the other side, we see a torch up with a bull and a tree in leaf, indicating spring. Where did that come from? I'm sorry? This is, this is a drawing of a Mithraic monument that has since been lost. Nobody knows where it is, although the, uh, the upper part of it, I believe, has now been found. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a big question, which we should probably save until uh, I've said a few more details about it, and then, then, then we can open it up for, for large questions like that. So the, the torchbearers become, uh, their, their meaning becomes obvious. It becomes self-evident given the rest of the, of the hypothesis. They represent the equinoxes. Now, there's a very interesting problem. Raised by, and I don't know if any of you noticed this. Here's a picture of the constellation Taurus with Perseus above. Notice that the constellation Taurus is facing to the left, whereas the constellation in, uh, whereas the bull in the Mithraic bull slaying scenes, uh, well, I don't have to show you, you've seen it, <laughs> always faces to the right. 
What could be the explanation of that? Doesn't that disprove the entire hypothesis? The fact is that the constellation Taurus, as seen in the night sky, always is seen facing to the left. What could be happening here? Well, I only discovered the solution to this. I've been working on this research for about 12 years now, and I only discovered the solution to this about uh, a year and a half ago. I'm not going to talk about this tonight. Um, don't have time to talk about this. I'm going to move to the explanation for the position of the bull. Uh, if Mithras is, as I claim, a god capable of shifting the entire cosmic sphere, then he must have been imagined in some sense as residing outside of the cosmos. He is hypercosmic, beyond the stars, capable of moving the universe. He's larger than the universe. Now, that being the case, we have an explanation, I think, for a very common motif in Mithraic iconography, found in almost every Mithraic temple, and that is the so-called rock birth of Mithras, in which Mithras is, being shown, is shown being born out of a rock. He breaks through the rock out into the space around it. Now, we know from ancient sources that the Mithraic temple, uh, the cave within which Mithras is depicted killing the bull, the Mithraic cave was meant to be an image of the cosmos. We have ancient texts that, that tell us this. Now, if the cave within which Mithras kills the bull is meant to be an image of the cosmos, it must be an image of the cosmos as seen from the inside. It's a hollow cave. You look out and see the cave around you. It's the cosmos from the inside. This raises the possibility, since a cave is a hollow space inside uh, the rocky earth, this raises the possibility that the rock out of which Mithras is born represents the cosmos, the, co the great cosmic sphere, as seen from the outside and the Mithras breaking out of it represents his power to transcend the cosmos, uh, to take his place outside the universe, from which vantage point he can then move the entire world. Here's another example of Mithras born from the rock. Very often, uh, the rock is shown entwined with a snake which to classicists uh, recalls uh, unmistakably, there's no way around it, it recalls the great cosmic egg that was entwined by a serpent, uh, which according to ancient Orphic mythology was the, uh, the egg out of which the cosmos was born the great cosmic egg entwined by the serpent time. And here is a picture of the Orphic god Phanes, the shining one, who was born out of the cosmic egg. The lower half of it is here, the upper half of it is above his head. And notice that he is entwined with a snake holding a staff, just like the Mithraic lion-headed god surrounded by the zodiac, and he even has a lion's head on his chest. This is not a Mithraic monument. This is an or the Orphic god, Phanes, breaking out of the cosmic egg. And I'll just show you the lion-headed god again. So you notice Phanes is winged, <coughs> has wings just like the, the lion-headed god. And the lion-headed god has the zodiac on his body, just as the Orphic god is surrounded by the zodiac and is standing on the cosmic sphere, out of which probably the Orphic god is, is breaking. This is not Orphic. 
This is Mithraic. This is Mithras breaking out of the cosmic egg surrounded by the zodiac, proving that the rock out of which Mithras was born was identified with the cosmic sphere, which for the Orphics was the egg out of which uh, Phanes was born. Mithras breaks open the cosmic sphere and penetrates to the realms outside. Oh, where is that from? Uh, this is from England, I believe. Uh, the so-called Housesteads Monument is found in, in Housesteads, England. Um, now, what does it mean to break out of the cosmos? You've all seen this image. I've even seen it upstairs in Brian Swim's office, I believe. It's a huge poster of it. This is an image that is permeating our culture at the moment. I have a collection of, uh, it's now up to 15 books that have this image on the cover. Probably a lot of you have seen them, some of them. I have, I've been collecting them for quite a while. I want to read to you a passage from Plato from his dialogue with Phaedrus. Plato is describing uh, in the 4th century BC long before the origins of the Mithraic Mysteries, is describing the ascent of the soul up through the heavens until, Plato says, it reaches the outermost boundary, the sphere of the fixed stars, the great heaven that rotates around the earth and contains everything within it. And then Plato says, uh, for those souls that are most highly advanced, as soon as they are at the summit, they come forth and stand upon the back of the world, and straightway the revolving heaven carries them round, and then, says Plato, they look upon the regions without, the regions outside the cosmos. Of that place beyond the heavens, says Plato, None of our earthly poets has yet sung, and none shall sing in a worthy manner. But this is the manner of it, for assuredly we must be bold to speak what is true, above all when our discourse is upon truth. It is there, in that place beyond the heavens, that true being dwells, without color or shape that cannot be touched. Reason alone, the soul's pilot, can behold it, and all true knowledge is knowledge thereof. The ultimate mystery, true being itself, for Plato, is in that hypercosmic realm beyond the outermost boundary of the universe. And that's what this uh, young adventurer is experiencing in this famous image penetrating beyond the cosmic sphere to the realms outside. Now, finally, I want you to imagine what he would see if he were to continue to crawl through the hole in the universe to the outside and then look back. What would he see? He would see a great sphere, the great cosmic sphere from the outside. This is what he would see. This is an image of Atlas who carries the, the great sphere of the universe on his shoulders. Uh, this is from the 17th century. This is Atlas holding the universe. He is outside of the universe in the hypercosmic region. And there you see all the constellations depicted as they would be seen from the outside. Uh, and they're vertical. If you look at the cosmos from the outside, the bull is seen facing to the right. This is Mithras in the role of Atlas, holding on his shoulder the sphere of the universe. This is a Mithraic monument from Germany. And this is an ancient image of Atlas 
from the Hellenistic period, not long after the Mithraic Mysteries, the famous uh, Atlas Farnese globe. It's in the Farnese Museum in Italy. Uh, and images like this were known in antiquity. Hipparchus, we know, had a cosmic sphere in his uh, laboratory, which he worked with as an astronomer, in which, on which he could see the universe as seen from the outside. And on the Atlas Farnese globe, an, an ancient image of the universe seen from the outside, we have here a detail showing the constellation Taurus facing to the right, just as in the Mithraic bull slung icon, uh, indicating that the fact that the bull faces to the right in the Mithraic icon uh, indicates that Mithras is essentially a hypercosmic entity, a being whose power resides in his being located beyond the universe in such a way that he uh, has the uh, potential and the ability to <coughs> shift the cosmic spheres, to change the entire universe. That is who Mithras is. And finally, I'll, I'll end with an image uh, that I, I think, I may be a little biased here, but I think it's one of the most beautiful images that has come down to us from all of antiquity. It was found in a Mithraic temple uh, that was discovered in, 19, in the 1960s. Uh, an old man in the countryside outside Rome who had a, 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 a small garden and, and house there decided to expand his wine cellar, which he had in his house, and he knocked down a wall in the wine cellar and there on the other side was a Mithraic temple. Yeah. This was in the, the mid-1960s. It was quite a discovery. Uh, it's in uh, the town of um, Marino, M-A-R-I-N-O, in Italy. Very small town. Uh, I was there last year. Maybe we could have the lights off for this last image. Mithras in spectacular color with the entire starry sky contained beneath his cape, proving indeed that Mithras is uh, the god who, whose essential uh, nature is that he rules over the world of the stars.